I'm mm. really honest. The mm. reason is at the end of the day, willing or not willing, everybody will have to come to the planner because especially in a project where you have engineering, you have procurement, you have you know different contractors working or even uh, external resources uh, if you outsource engineering or whatsoever. At the end of the day, you are involved in every single discussion and if you, if you are like a sponge in the sense of this information, you come out after, for example, one project and you probably know more than having done two projects as only as a, as a project manager. Because you are literally in any single discussion, being it technical or being it commercial or being it, uh, you know, uh, legal, you are always there because you need to know, you need then to put this information in the schedule in order to give the scenarios. It's actually brilliant. I really liked it because I remember when I, you know, when I started to do something a little bit different than just the, the project planner or, you know, the site planner and how this information came in handy when I started to do, you know, the project manager or even the general manager because I knew I could go alone myself into the program. Of course, I was asking the planner, but if there was something which I was not 100% sure, Oh, I could go into the program. I could do my critical path. I could come out with my own, uh, with my own scenarios and strategies. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely um, there's definitely big uh, advantages to understanding the plan planning uh, role, and then also you know as you say using that if you're a project manager um, or even cost manager or commercial manager or, or any other role on the project really because. For me, you know, um, the schedule drives everything, you know, schedule is king. Oh, yeah. Um, but I wanted to, because you were chatting there a little bit about information, you know, and, you know, how it all comes together. Now, um, I know that Val recently had an amazing opportunity to um, do a webinar um, with the Australian Institute of Project Managers um, on the future of PMO and what it might look like and disrupting it <laughs> with, you know, data science perhaps and big data. Yeah. Is the, in your opinion, Marco, is, is the, um, with that in mind, is the um, role of the planner going to change at all going forward as new technology comes into play? Um, or will it stay at the heart of it, the, the core role remain the same, regardless of whether there's artificial intelligence or machine learning or, or anything else that comes into it? I think that the planner will still be at the heart of everything. I make an example, 4D planning, okay? I've used the 4D plannings when probably it was at the very beginning, but I still know that it hasn't really, I mean, it, it went length as to what we did, but at the end of the day, you still need somebody which is able to interpret the data. And now, I'm, again, I'm going to be a little bit uh, controversial. There is such a big thing on LinkedIn also, if you go on the, on the data dashboards, how to present the information. But there's still the basic behind this data. You know, it's the same term, <laughs> rubbish in, rubbish out. You can have something shiny, fantastic that you look at, but the still core part behind the scenes is still the normal, I mean, the normal is still the, the you know, the, the, yeah, the, the normal planning way for, for getting this information. Now, with the, with the new uh, techniques or new programs which are coming out, probably you will be faster. Probably there are elements of, you know, for example, these new tools where you can go on site and uh, directly with the, with the barcode, you can, you can know, for example, all the pipes which have been installed or quantities and in real time it feeds into the into the into the primavera that's all fantastic but you still need somebody which puts the forecast <laughs> which understands what is the link between the activities uh, yeah. i still believe that there always will be a brain behind and that's the reason why i was mm. i was so keen in saying a project planner must have this holistic understanding of of the project in order to, to give that added value. Because otherwise, if you just see inputs data, comes out with the dashboard. Mm. Yeah, you also have that other dimension that we've probably spoken about as, you know, you've you got to be a good storyteller if you're in PMO. So if you don't understand what oh, you're yeah. doing, who's, who's going to tell the story? Who's going to know whether, you know, the machine is telling you the truth or not? Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to go hand back to, to Val because I know he's, he's burning to, to ask you quite a few questions there. So, 
Well, this is, you know, and it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things I presented at our AIPM uh, market was, was very similar. It was, but it was almost about um, what we called low value transactional tasks and that mm-hmm. the real, the real gain for technology is going to be that, you know, you're not going to have a planner running around with a piece of paper, getting an update each month. That should be the things that we're trying to remove uh, the administration burden on um, talented resources, right? Because obviously these, these resources need to be um, re- redefined in a way to, to look at higher value tasks and do less of the kind of moving, you know, uh, information between systems, uh, printing out reports, uh, reviewing packs, you know, this all can be done electronically and online. Absolutely. Um, but what, one of the things I, I, I was interested about is, is the planning role itself might not change, but certainly how they operate will change in the, in the future with, with BIM. And you mentioned, um, uh, 4D, which is you know something that I think most projects should have as a minimum now. Um, but obviously, it's in, it's it's the appetite, isn't it? I mean, we we want to get to a plate where we can visualize, design, and look at the timeline together. But but how yeah. mature is that really from your experience across the world? But that's but that's exactly the problem. So it it is fantastic. For example, when you when I was doing when, when we I mean I pir- my point when I say pioneered is not in general, it's for me in a sense, when we tried mm. it for the first times, uh, there was an incredible added value when we were doing, for example, the reviews uh, of, the, of the side channels, because it was quite nice to see if there was a, you know, a crane sitting somewhere on a given time where we wanted to excavate for putting the cooling water pipes in, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, there is one big problem, and still I know that it is not 100% solved in this moment, which is you need to link the, your activities to a 3D model in order to do that. Right. The problem yeah. is that unless you are doing... So it worked perfectly, for example, for turbo machines, where the, once the design is done, the machine will never change. So you could actually show in a time lapse how it is built. Okay, mm-hmm. But the moment you go to... to um, the classical projects where you do your engineering and then you start your construction when you know your piling input starts to come out but in the meantime you go on with your silly guy drawings your arrangements and blah 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 the problem is that you don't have normally at the beginning a 3d model which is finished you normally have 60 percent 90 percent and then it's complete probably at the end of the project each time the 3d model changes you have to redo all the links with the activities with the 3D model. Mm. And if okay. you go to a certain level of detail, obviously you can remain on quite a high level, but then it, the added value goes a little bit away. You know, if you put, I don't know, a WBS link to all the activities, probably it will not really help you. So if you go to a, to a good level of details to enable you to do this, uh, this uh, you know, for example, hazard studies uh, where you want to see also, or CDM reviews where you want to see if I can go to the pipe and make my, um, mm-hmm. uh, my checks and so on in a safe way. Each day that the 3D model changes, you will see a poor planner will start to cry because he has to remake all the links from the activities to the 3D model. And I think, at, at, I mean, for my knowledge at least, and I can be disproved, uh, I don't think that this has been 100% solved. You still need a link between the 3D model and the, and the shed. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you're right. There's a few hurdles for BIM and this 4D modeling to get over before it becomes mainstream. Is what you're saying, and I I, I agree with that. And the, the other thing was was around um, was was around some of these other facets. So just switching from um, from BIM to something that I've had little to do with, but I appreciate it, which is delay forensics. So. You talked about contract law and, and obviously the, the value add that planners have when it comes to delays on programs and what's driving what. Um, what first of all, what's your, what's your definition of, of delay forensics and how is it useful on a project? So uh, projects will be delayed. Uh, that's a given. Mm. <laughs> For many reasons. I mean, uh, it can be because obviously when you start, you don't have all the information. It can be because certain things changes. I mean, there can be thousands of reasons. But let's say if you go in a normal project, the, the project will be somehow delayed. Uh, now, you can be lucky. Like, for example, we were in Asia quite lucky despite some, some problems here and there. We were able to. But also 